I wanted to tell the story of one of the greatest leaders that the world has ever known, who we almost don't know anything about. If you look up Minshu Hotep in the Wikipedia, it, ha it has like one paragraph. But he's the founder of the second golden age, the classical period. He is the one that defeated the Hyksos. His grandfather fought, his father fought, his uncle fought, and he was the one that completed the battle that kicked the Hyksos off and built the first great wall. Like you think the wall of China? He built the wall, keeping the Asiatics out. And it was a hundred and something years before they were, almost 200 years before they were able to get enough strength to come back into Kemet at the end of the 13th so-called dynasty. I wanted people to know. I would go into schools teaching African history. Uh, you ever heard of Menchu Hotep? They were like, who? What? Is that something to eat? Is that a sandwich? You know, like, I'm like, no, y'all. This, <laughs> this is a great kid. You know, so I, I took it upon myself as a personal vendetta. I'm going to write this book because we knew all the facts. I knew who his wives were. I knew who his uh, uh, chancellor was. I knew who was the vizier. I knew, you know, his children his child, you know, his parents. I knew the theme, I knew the history of the time, I knew the battles, I knew everything. But all those were, they were just bullets. It didn't have any essence to it. You didn't know his personality, his character. You didn't know what was driving him. His father wanted him to be a magi because he knew he needed to have warrior skills that they didn't have. His, grand, his uncle and grandfather, they died in battle. So they knew that the son, Minchu Hotep, needed some skills that he didn't have. So he and, um, challenged him to become a Magi. And so he was gonna be one of the first Magi kings of Kemet since the first golden age. And, you know, so he ruled for almost 54 years, so I couldn't put it just in one book, you know, as I consulted people, so I broke it into two volumes. The first volume is his early life, all the way to he becomes the king, the Nasut Biti, and it book ends with him defeating the Hyksos. But now, the real work has to happen. He has to unify the country, which is a hard thing to do. You got, it would be equivalent to trying to get these Negroes in America together. So Minshew Hotep had the same challenge. He had, like the, after the Civil War, you had the North and the South, the divided, and you had to bring the nation back together. Except for Minshew Hotep did a better job than they did here in America. So he had to erase the stigma of Nubians to the south and unite them with his country to help build his country up. He had to kick the foreigners out and he had to unite all the people as one. And so now that's what I wanted to write. And I wanted to talk about West, the, the Sahara, the Africans who migrated from the, from the West so where Nat the Playa is and going all the way across to Yam. And so in volume two, Shimsu Haru, which is the follower of Haru now, of Minchu Hotep, which is the title that most kings have, is the second half of the story. So all those illustrations I have in there are real artifacts. I want people to understand. In for DC, they just get an artist and paint those pictures of the, the, the rock paintings and stuff like that. Those were all real artifacts, real pictures that were taken. It shows uh, Khufu, during Khufu's time, his son um, and grandson had made trips all the way across to West Africa and they left records of this or in the mountains and on Cape. And I took the pictures of this, showing that Minchu Hotep was just doing what other kings and predecessors had done, as he traveled all the way to Yam and connected with his people in the West. And it showed that much of the astronomy and astrology and some of the rock the, uh, craftsmanship and rock building and even mummification came from the Africans who were from the Western Sahara, and who migrated when the desert dried up those people migrated into the Hopi Valley. Uh, not the Playa shows that that was a civilization about 5,000 BCE. So around 5,000 BC, the Hopi, I mean, uh, the Nile uh, was still flowing here, but the Sahara Desert wasn't a complete desert. It was more like a Sahil. And so people were still living there. And now after 5,000, 
temperature got more intense, the monsoon rain shift towards Ethiopia and the Sudan in that way, and, and then that dried up. So those people migrated into So I wanted to capture all of that. And Menchu Hotep has witnessed it firsthand. And he's recording it. And he goes back and he realizes that the imperishable stars that you see in the desert, in the Sahara, are the same ones you see in Kemet, written on the walls. So just like a sea person has to navigate from the sky, like that, desert dwellers have to do the same thing. Well, it's equivalent to being in the middle of the ocean. There are no landmarks. So that's why we got this keen observation of the stars so that we can navigate through the desert. And then we use that same knowledge to navigate the oceans and the seas. That's how we got to Mexico, the Americas, the South Pacific and all those places. Because we already had made the charts charted the sky, charted the sky, made star maps, <laughs> and so we knew how to navigate the oceans and the desert, just like you can navigate the, the forest or the savannah. So I put that in Minchu Hotep book number two. So he brings that back together. So I'm trying to connect all those dots so that people can see. So by the time the third golden age comes in, it becomes the real glory because now they got all of this information that Menchu brought in, that he preserved from the first golden age. And so the people in the third golden age uh, inherited all of this information. And so that you can see where Kenneth reaches zenith at that point.